I need um I need I need the address. Who 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 okay I'll I'll text it to you. She got it. Okay. Okay. Hold on just a second. Yeah, I know. Let me get him started first. He just won't, he won't bring, he won't come in, we'll get everybody started, and then we'll reset the other books, we'll take care of that. Chief Judge, you're glad to presiding. Court call to order. Hi, right, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Please be seated. That's the best address. Call me. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to go ahead and uh, take roll this morning. We're back on the record in the matter of the state of Georgia versus Khalif Adams et al. In 22 SC 183572. I'm going to just go ahead and take roll for the morning at this point. Uh, Mr. Stilwell, Mr. Botts, and Mr. Sharp. Good morning, gentlemen. Good morning, Mr. Williams, Mr. Adams, Mr. Steele, and Ms. Renard. Good morning. Good morning. Mr. Kendrick, Mr. Apt, Mr. Hingerty, and Mr. Weinstein. Good morning. Good morning, Mr. All right. Mr. Huey, Mr. Matthews, Jr., and Sr. Good morning. Good morning, Mr. All right. And Mr. Uh, oh, you have another counsel with you, Mr. Huey? Good morning, madam. All right. And uh, Mr. Nichols, Mr. Harvey, Mr. Garner, Ms. Westmoreland, good morning. And uh, Mr. Ryan and Ms. D. Williams, good morning. All right. All right, counsel for the state, uh, ladies, uh, Ms. Love and uh, Ms. Hilton, Mr. Brown and Mr. Smith, good morning. All right, um, counsels, we are at this point in time waiting for one juror that has still not been able to be located. I have asked. Uh, our sheriff's team to go ahead and see if they can find her. Um, and that's what we're waiting on at this point in time. So uh, we're going to just be in pause or in recess until that time comes. And then uh, we'll go ahead and get started once our juror uh, gets here. Okay? So we're going to be in recess probably in, until I get some more uh, indication on what our efforts are to locate that juror. So we're in recess at this point in time. You can recess in place at this point, okay? Thank you. All right. Thank you. Let me make a couple of announcements while I'm still on record for our, for our folks here in the gallery on embedded media, all right? You are welcome, uh, and we appreciate your uh, the, the full and free and fair press uh, and, the, and the benefits of the First Amendment. I would just ask you respectfully to remind you, and I know you all as seasoned journalists know this, do not take pictures of our jurors, do not try and inter, you know, intercede or, or, or um, try and talk to them in any way. And that goes for anybody else in this courtroom. The jurors are not to be uh, tried to, to be uh, interfered with in any way or tried to talk to or anything. I know you all know that, and I know you all won't do that, but just, just, just so we kind of are all on the same sheet of music. If you have photographic or other equipment, um, I'd ask that you put it on your silent mode. Some of you have shutters that I can actually hear. So if you could change the setting on those, that would be great. Um, and the last thing I'd just tell you is just please go ahead and within the dictates of your Rule 22, please go ahead and just follow that. Um, so um, if you have any questions, you can certainly ask me at the appropriate time. But all of you are welcome. Okay, all right, so we're going to be in recess until I find out more about whether our, uh, where our juror is, and then we'll go ahead and get started. All right, so we're in recess.
All right, Deputy Ingram, I understand all of our jurors are here at this point in time. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Clerk, we're down to the board. All right. All right, if we could summon our jurors for us, please, and uh, Deputy Ingram, if you would have them, as we talked about earlier, not everybody except the last row. Gotcha. Okay, all right. Is everybody here? Everybody present? Mr. Sharp is coming in here. All right, well, I'm okay, I'm worried about him right now, okay? But, all right. George President Council. All right, ladies and gentlemen, please be seated. All jurors present? Yes, sir. All right, okay. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen of the jury. Good morning. Oh, come on, that sounds so lame. Come on, right, let's try that again. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning. Oh, much better, much better. Um, ladies and gentlemen, as you know, I'm Chief Judge Earl Glanville, and I'm presiding over the trial of this case. And at this point in time, I'm going to introduce my chamber staff. Um, in the courtroom, I have my court reporter. Ms. Christina Weaver, uh, she's my official court reporter. And then to my right, your left, is Ms. Violetta Omana, who's my judicial assistant. To my left, immediate left, is Mr. Wesley Kearns. Uh, he's my staff attorney. Uh, and then the gentleman you just brought you out is uh, 
Sergeant Tim Ingram. So, and then I have another litigation manager upstairs, Edward Chamberlain, uh, and you'll meet him at some point in time if you haven't met him already when you were here before. So, as I mentioned earlier, they're here to assist me and will be happy to help you in any way you can. Um, your principal point of contact, should you be running late or anything should happen to you or you need to kind of reach us before the time period. I understand one of you had a car issue this morning. So, that's the, you all still have my cards? Okay, and if you don't, I'll give, I got plenty more. We'll give, we'll give you some before you leave today. If you're going to be running late or anything, please contact uh, Ms. Umana and let her know so that I can kind of keep track of you and I can let the parties know where you are. But it is very important that you all get here on time. We were supposed to start at 9 o'clock this morning. It's now almost 1030. So it just, I can't do anything until all 18 of you are here. So please mind your time. Only you know how long it takes you to get from wherever you live in our great county, downtown, Fulton County, I mean, to the courthouse and all the machinations that you have to go through. So leave early. You can always come a little bit early and, and uh, be comfortable and be seated in your in your headquarters or jury deliberation room, okay? All right, but at any point in time during recesses, you can approach my staff, or as I mentioned earlier, um, any of the people from our sheriff's department who are in the gray and black uh, uniforms, you can, you're can you authorized to talk with them. Before we uh, get into preliminary instructions, ladies and gentlemen, I have some administrative matters to discuss with you. I've already introduced my staff, and I encourage you to, to approach them if you have questions. Remember, uh, the sheriff's deputies have shown you how to get to the jury room, how you arrive here every day. Okay, so you're never to come in the front door of the courtroom. You always go in to the rear and go directly into your headquarters or jury deliberation room. And from this point on, you're not going to enter the courtroom until unless one of the deputies brings you out from the jury room. After breaks and the beginning of the day, when you arrive, you'll go straight to the jury room. And our deputies, as I mentioned earlier when you were here a little bit earlier, gave you the nickel tour of the courthouse, so all of you know how to get from the front entrance up here to the her headquarters, is that right? Okay, we talked a little bit about, orientated about, about meals and how you can, uh, there's a cafeteria that's uh, directly behind you, we talked a little bit about that. Since you were here, you like the space back there? Yes. It no longer looks like a dump. <laughs> we painted it, Thank got you some fresh tables, chairs, and uh, some a, refri a couple of refrigerators, a microwave, a coffee pot, and we'll make sure that we uh, we go ahead and, and make sure that is cleaned and maintained for your use. I want you to be very comfortable while you're in there. But um, as I mentioned to you earlier, it might be better just to bring your lunch or bring your comfort items, but we'll make sure that you have some place to store them and uh, otherwise can warm up your lunch if you feel necessary. All right, I would ask that you wear your juror stickers when you're here in the courthouse, and all of you have juror stickers, wonderful. If you don't, when you go back in there, put one on, and remember at the end of the day, take one, put it in your wallet, your purse, your briefcase, whatever you may have, and put it on when you come back in the courtroom, and uh, in, in the courthouse. This is so the lawyers and the witnesses can identify you as a juror. From this point on, the lawyers, the parties, the witnesses, or anyone else associated with this case, except for my staff, or the, our sheriff's deputies, is prohibited from having any contact with you whatsoever. If you happen to encounter any one of them on the street or in the elevator, Please do not attempt to communicate with them in any way and do not be offended, as I mentioned to you earlier, if they ignore you, okay? They're just adhering to their responsibilities and roles as officers of this court to not have any direct or incidental contact with you. So um, please don't uh, be offended. Uh, if you should some reason have contact with one of the lawyers or if you inadvertently overhear something about this case, please notify one of my deputies or my staff immediately. Now this also, ladies and gentlemen, pertains to third parties or anybody else that may try and talk with you. Um, if anybody else, other than the folks I told you about the lawyers, attempts to talk with you in any way, emails you, texts you, tries to communicate with you when you're, when you're going to and from, we need to know about it immediately, okay? So please tell me if that uh, should happen. We generally hold court from 9 a.m. to about 6 p.m. or thereabouts. Um, 
We'll take some short comfort breaks as needed throughout the day and a longer break for lunch. And for the sake of your fellow jurors and, and the parties, as I mentioned earlier, please make every effort to be on time as we cannot begin or continue the case until all of 18 of you are present. If something unexpected happens and you absolutely cannot help being late, please call my office and contact Ms. Umana and she'll let me know and let us know accordingly. All right, ladies and gentlemen, now, I'm going to cover some basic principles of criminal law. I'm going to explain my role, your role, and the lawyer's roles. And then finally, I'm going to tell you how the, how the trial will proceed. Since many of you haven't served on a jury before, so this should help you in understanding how a trial proceeds and what is expected of you during the trial. Now, you've been selected and sworn to try the following. The criminal case of the state of Georgia versus Marquavius Huey. The Fulton County Grand Jury has indicted the defendant, Marquavius Huey, with the following offenses, which I'll read to you. Conspiracy to violate the Racketeering Influence and Corrupt Organizations Act. Armed robbery. Aggravated assault with a deadly weapon. Aggravated assault with a deadly weapon. Possession of a firearm and a commission of a felony. Possession of a firearm and a commission of a felony. Armed robbery, armed robbery, aggravated assault with a deadly weapon, aggravated assault with a deadly weapon, hijacking a motor vehicle in the first degree, possession of a firearm in a commission of a felony, possession of a firearm in a commission of a felony, participation in criminal street gang activity, participation in criminal street gang activity, participation in criminal street gang activity, possession of a weapon by an incarcerated individual, possession of a telecommunication device by an incarcerated individual, and participation in criminal street gang activity. The criminal case of the state of Georgia versus DeMonte Kendrick, the Fulton County Grand Jury has indicted the defendant, DeMonte Kendrick, for the following crimes, which I'll read to you now. Conspiracy to violate the Racketeering Influence and Corrupt Organizations Act. Murder. Participation in criminal street gang activity. Violation of the Georgia Controlled Substances Act. Violation of the Georgia Controlled Substances Act. Violation of the Georgia Controlled Substances Act. Possession of a firearm and a commission of a felony. Possession of a machine gun and possession of a firearm by a convicted felon, previously convicted of a felony in involving the use or possession of a firearm. The criminal case of the state of Georgia versus Cormarius Nichols. The Fulton County Grand Jury has indicted the defendant, Cormarius Nichols, for the following crimes, which I'll read to you now. Conspiracy to violate the Racketeering Influence and Corrupt Organizations Act. Murder. Participation in criminal street gang activity. Participation in criminal street gang activity, possession of a firearm by a convicted felon, previously convicted of felony involving the use or possession of a firearm, possession of a firearm in a commission of a felony, and possession of a firearm by a convicted felon, previously convicted of felony involving the use or possession of a firearm. The criminal case of the state of Georgia versus Rodeus Ryan. The Fulton County Grand Jury has indicted the defendant Rodeus Ryan for the following crime, which I will read to you now, conspiracy to violate the Racketeering Influence and Corrupt Organizations Act. The criminal case of the state of Georgia versus Shannon Stilwell. The Fulton County Grand Jury has indicted the defendant Shannon Stilwell for the following crimes, which I will now read to you, conspiracy to violate the Racketeering Influence and Corrupt Organizations Act, murder, murder, participation in criminal street gang activity, participation in criminal street gang activity, Possession of a firearm by a convicted felon, previously convicted of felony involving the use or possession of a firearm. Possession of a firearm during a commission of a felony and possession of a firearm by a convicted felon, previously convicted of felony involving the use or possession of a firearm. The criminal case of the state of Georgia versus Jeffrey Williams. The Fulton County Grand Jury has indicted the defendant Jeffrey Williams for the following crimes, which I will now read to you. Conspiracy to violate the Racketeering Influence and Corrupt Organizations Act. Participation in criminal street gang activity. Participation in criminal street gang activity. Violation of the Georgia Controlled Substances Act. Violation of the Georgia Controlled Substances Act. Violation of the Georgia Controlled Substances Act. Possession of a firearm or a commission of a felony. And possession of a machine gun. Each of the defendants have pled not guilty to this indictment, and each of them deny every charge in it. This indictment and the defendants' pleas of not guilty present the issue that you have been selected and sworn to decide. 
The indictment is a way that the defendants are charged with committing crimes that violate the laws of Georgia. The charges in the indictment and the pleas of, of not guilty are not evidence of guilt, and you may not conclude that the defendants are guilty based on the charges or the, or the not guilty pleas. Each of the defendants is presumed to be innocent until, it, until he is individually proven guilty. The defendants begin the trial with a presumption of innocence in their favor, and this presumption stays with them until it is overcome by the state with evidence that convinces you beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendants are guilty of the crimes charged. You may not convict any one of the defendants of any crime unless each element of the crime is proved beyond a reasonable doubt. The burden of proof is on the state to prove every essential element of the crimes charged in the indictment beyond a reasonable doubt. The defendants have no burden at all, and the burden never shifts to any one of the defendants to prove his innocence. However, the state is not required to prove the guilt of the defendants beyond all doubt or to a mathematical certainty. A reasonable doubt means just what it says. It is a doubt of a fair-minded, impartial juror who is honestly seeking the truth. It is a doubt based upon common sense and reason. It does not mean a vague or arbitrary doubt, but is a doubt for which you can give a reason based on a consideration of the evidence or a lack of evidence, a conflict in the evidence, or any combination of these. After considering all the facts and circumstances of this case, if your minds are wavering, unsettled, or unsatisfied, then that is a doubt of the law, and you must find the defendants not guilty. But if no reasonable doubt exists in your minds about the defendant's guilt, then you may convict the defendants. If the state does not prove the defendant's guilt beyond a reasonable doubt, your duty would be to find the defendants not guilty. My role is to determine the law that applies to this case. Then I will instruct you on the law that you must apply to the facts in reaching a verdict. I'm giving you some of those instructions now. I will give you more detailed instructions at the end of the trial. The jury has a very important role. You must decide the facts of the case from the evidence presented and then apply the law that I give you to those facts. Evidence is how a fact is proved or disproved. Evidence can be either testimonial or exhibits. Testimony is what you'll hear from people who take the witness stand right here and swear to tell the truth. However, the questions the lawyers ask the witnesses are not evidence. Exhibits are documents, photographs, and other physical items that are admitted during trial. The object of this trial is to discover the truth. During the trial, I will admit evidence according to the rules of evidence. Those rules are designed to aid in the discovering the truth by making sure that you consider only the best and highest evidence. The lawyers are advocates for their clients and they have the duty to represent their clients to the best of their ability. They must follow the rules of law, trial procedure, and evidence during the trial. They may make motions or objections if they believe that any rule is not being followed. Remember, what the lawyers say in making or responding to objections is not evidence. I will admit or exclude evidence according to the rules. If the lawyers make an objection and I overrule it, that means the evidence is admitted and you may consider it. On the other hand, if I sustain an objection, this means the evidence is excluded from the trial and you may not consider it. You should only consider, you should consider only that testimony and only those exhibits that are admitted. You should not assume or infer anything about evidence which I have excluded. If you happen to hear or see evidence that I end up excluding from the trial, you must disregard it entirely in your deliberations and in arriving at your verdict. None of my decisions and nothing I say during the trial are evidence. My decisions and remarks do not mean that I favor or lean to one side or another in this case. I am only interested in seeing that this case is fairly tried based upon the laws and constitution of the state of Georgia and the constitution of the United States. 
Sometimes I may deal with, have to deal with the lawyer's motions or objections without you being here in the courtroom, and if so, I'll excuse you from the jury room. So what I'll say, ladies and gentlemen, is, ladies and gentlemen, there's a matter we need to take up if you retire to your headquarters, your jury liberation room, and I'll wait for other instruction. That's my most artful way of telling you we need to take up something outside your presence and hearing, okay? I'll try and limit those interruptions, and I ask that you be patient when they do happen. I can't tell you when those will happen, but sometimes they do. Um, so please be, I'll ask for your patience in advance on that particular matter. So the trial will proceed as follows. First, the attorneys may give what's called opening statements. No attorney is required to make an opening statement. Opening statements are not evidence. They're simply an introduction to the evidence, a preview or an outline of the expected evidence. The state goes first because they have the burden of proof. Second, the evidence will be presented. Third, the lawyers may give closing arguments or summations. They may discuss the law that applies to this case and how you should consider the law in light of the evidence. They may also point out evidence that they believe supports their position. What the lawyers say in closing arguments is not evidence. The goal of a closing argument is to persuade you to decide the case in their favor. Fourth, then I will explain to you the specific law that applies to this case. This is referred to as charging the jury. I will then ask you to go to the jury room, your headquarters, to deliberate and to reach your verdict. It is important that you pay close attention during this trial. If at any time you cannot hear or see any evidence or you're suffering from any discomfort that distracts you, please inform me or one of my deputies or my team and we'll do whatever's needed to make sure you can hear and see the evidence and give it your undivided attention. If you need a break at any point in time, please raise your hand or alert our, one of our deputies. The jurors are not allowed to question witnesses. However, if you have a question you believe is important for your determination of facts, please write down your question, give it to one of the deputies, and I will determine whether or not it should be asked. If you have a question while the evidence is being presented, please keep in mind that you do not yet heard all of the evidence and your question may be answered by the time the rest of the evidence has been presented. You should only consider evidence with an open, or you should consider the evidence with an open mind, and you should not reach any final conclusions until the trial is over. Do not jump to conclusions before all the evidence is presented. To maintain the integrity of the jury system, I'm going to remind you again, remember my ad nauseum admonitions? Okay, y'all shaking your heads like, okay, we're going to go through those one more time. I'm going to remind you that you must disguise this case only based on the evidence admitted during the trial and the law I will explain to you. You may not conduct any research on your own about this case or about any people or places mentioned during the trial. You may not visit any places mentioned in the evidence. You may not refer to any books or documents that were not admitted during the trial. You may not use any dictionaries or other reference materials. You may not use Google or any other search engines or any other resource matters, uh, the internet, websites, or blogs. You may not use any other electronic media to get information about this case. You should not use any of the sources to get any information about the legal terms or about the law. And finally, you may not listen to any accounts of this trial that may appear in the news media, whether it's online, in print, on the radio, on your cell phones, or any other smart devices that you may have, or any other mediums. Remember, you are the ones that have been qualified as fair and impartial jurors deciding this case. No other influence should affect your decision. For that reason, as I mentioned earlier, part of my admonitions, you may not discuss this case with anyone, including your family and friends, or, do, or let anyone discuss this case with you or around you or in your presence. This includes discussing or sharing information by email, text, blogging, or other form of social media until actual deliberations begin. That is, until after you've heard all the evidence, the lawyer's closing arguments, the law that applies to this case, 
You must not discuss the case even amongst yourselves in the jury room during breaks or other or elsewhere. Remember I told you would it be a violation for you to sit back in your headquarters jury liberation room after we take the first witness. Hey, what do you think? Is that a violation? Yes. Come on now. We all got to kind of shake our heads. Yes. Would it be a violation for you to be as you're walking lunch to, to recap and discuss the case? Yes. What about you in the bathroom? Yes. That's creepy. Remember I told you about that before? Okay, all right. So we're not going to do that, all right? But what about going to the jury shuttle? Yeah, that would be a violation as well, okay? What about if you're walking on Wednesdays and Tuesdays? Yeah. All right, okay. And how did I tell you you're probably going to get caught if you violate my admonitions? You're going to tell on yourself. That's right. Or somebody's going to tell me that you've been on some particular site or some particular issue. And you ought to be able to learn that. Okay, I'm proud of you. All right. But it's really important, ladies and gentlemen, because remember I told you, fair trial, just trial, lawful trial. So all of these things are really important in terms of the admonitions and how serious we are about you not being only hearing what's in this courtroom and only the cases presented to you. All right? So... You've been given pencils and writing utensils and pads for your note-taking and use during this trial. So what I want you to do at this point in time is take uh, and open your pad to the very first page. Uh, we, 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 for those of you that have them, okay? For the rest of you, I'm going to get, get you a pad, all right? Okay, does everybody have a pad? No. Okay. Okay. All right, who else doesn't have a pad? Do we have enough or we, we would, we'll, get, we'll get you one during the break? What I need you to do with all of you that have pads, go ahead and write your name on the very first page. Okay, that's your that's your pad. Okay, so um, so whenever you come back in, each uh, after breaks and everything else, um, don't if you're going to your headquarters, just leave your pad inside the basket. Okay, we're not going to take a look at it, and nobody's going to bother with it. Who else needs a pad? Everybody got a writing utensil, pen, or or pen or or pencil. Okay, for those of you who go ahead and who just got pads, go ahead and write your name on the very first page, the inside cover. Just go ahead and write your name on. That's your, and believe me, we have more pads. So if you get you know by the time the trial ends, if you need another pad, we will give you another one. Okay, so but. Leave them in your headquarters when you have breaks and go outside and for the end of the day. Just put them in there, uh, take another juror sticker out, and that will be kind of your, kind of your way to kind of just trade and make sure don't take them home with you. Um, then the next morning you can find your pad and you can kind of just be prepared to take notes, okay? So um, I'm going to tell you, tell you that again. Just leave your pads as you have breaks and everything else in your headquarters. At the end of the day, like I said before, we will secure your notes. Probably, that will probably be Miss Umana's job. And we'll just leave them in the basket. And we put the basket in your location. And then um, we bring the basket back down. So you all, when you come back tomorrow morning or whatever morning you come back, you'll have your, have your notepad. All right? Now, but please keep in mind, all right? You may take notes if you wish. If you do take notes, please do not your note, let your note-taking distract you from paying full attention to all the evidence and the witnesses. You may not share or discuss your notes with anyone until you start deliberating at the end of the case and I tell you how you to begin your deliberative process. Notes are not evidence. They're only memory aids. They are not more important than your own impression or memory of what the evidence may have been. You may consider another juror's notes to refresh your memory 
You should only rely on your own memory of the proceedings. Do not be influenced by the notes of other jurors unless they unless their notes help you in determining your own independent memory. You must leave your notes in the jury room except when you are in the courtroom. They will be collected by the court and destroyed at the end of, after you finish your deliberations. Ladies and gentlemen, you will not get a transcript of any witness testimony, so please remember what they said on the witness stand in a way that works best for you. Okay? I'm going to... So... I'm going to tell you a couple other administrator, or I, as I call, administeria. Ladies and gentlemen, I've tried a lot of jury cases, so some of the things I'm going to say to you are the result of debriefing a lot of other of our citizens. One of the questions I get on a routine basis is, Judge, what are you doing up here on the bench? All right? So I'm going to demystify that, and I'm going to tell you right now. So there won't be any... question about what you're about what I'm doing okay all right so as you can as I told you earlier I'm responsible for just about everything that goes on in this courtroom so on the bench here I do have a phone and I can make certain phone calls I need to these devices here ladies and gentlemen you're going to see us use them from time to time they are audio devices that each pair of litigants has on their table to allow them to hear bench conferences because I may have to take up things out you know, that, that I told you outside your presence in hearing, but we may not want to put you out of the courtroom, so we may come up here, I cut my microphone off, and everybody using these devices is able to hear the bench conference that I'm having. Will you be able to hear a bench conference? No. It's not for you to hear. So, But these devices allow us to do that. So if you see people putting on these particular devices to talk, such as this, you'll know that that's what's going on, okay? All right. To my left, I have, I, I do have a computer. I have a couple of different programs that are open that help me do legal research and other things to keep track of what's going on during the trial. And um, otherwise, I'm taking notes. So if you see me typing, don't, don't assume I'm booking my next vacation. I could probably be doing that, but um, I'm not. I do take notes and I do you know, pay attention to what's going on. I, 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 of course, I'm very interested in your um, comfortability and uh, I, I monitor everything that's going on here in the courtroom. So that's what I'm doing up here on the bench, all right? Um, one other thing that you might hear behind me is this bell that starts jingling, all right? And if you hear a jingling sound like a bell, Please don't think that I'm doing anything creepy up here, all right? I have a service dog behind me. His name is Jack. I think some of you may have seen him already. He is uh, he lives the best life ever. He's pampered. He's really and and he's a uh, he's he's a he is a Labrador retriever. He's about two, almost two and a half, three years old at this point in time. So, but if you hear that bell, that's him moving around, all right? He doesn't bark. He rarely might get, he rarely gets interested in what's going on, so he might come up here and look, but that's about it. Alright? Don't bring him any food either, okay? Alright? He is spoiled rotten. So um, please don't try and throw any food back here behind me or anything like that. He doesn't need anything else, okay? But if you hear that bell, hear that sound, that's what that's what's going on behind me. And he'll get up when we have breaks and whatever else. So um, but that's that's if you hear the bell, that's Jack. Alright. Um, count. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I think we're ready for the lawyers to begin their opening statements. And what we'll do is we'll probably go till probably about 12, 15 or so. And then whatever we don't get done, we'll just continue on at that point in time when we when you all come back from lunch. Okay? So at this point in time, uh, counsels, I'm going to invoke the rule of sequestration as to both sides. So anybody who's going to give testimony in this case, if you please absent yourself from the courtroom, please don't discuss your testimony to anybody except the attorneys in this case. So at this point in time, does the state wish to make an opening statement? The state All right, go right ahead, madam. Your Honor, I would ask the court regarding um, certain members that we have spoken with in court about in terms of witnesses and what they would like to remain in the courtroom. I believe the matter that we discussed, we won't be able to take up till Tuesday. So that person should probably be excluded. Uh, that, the, well, that person, if they're going to. But other than that, I think we've covered everybody else. 
Unless there's an exemption. Do you have an exemption to the sequestration? Your Honor, the family members of the victims themselves, they have standing to challenge the sequestration because they're not members of the family. I'm not worried about that. There's no issue about sequestration as it applies to them. Thank you, Your Honor. All right. Excuse me, Judge. I have several objections to the court's opening charge. Would you either reserve those? I'll reserve those. Thank you. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. Okay. Your Honor, may I please approach the bench? Say again? May I please approach with the state? Yes, Ms. D. Williams. For those of you that wish to listen in, you can go ahead and do so.
No, they should have them just. Everybody gets at least one. Who? No. No, they're not. They, they're not on camera, should they? Who? Then cut the camera off. Tell B let to cut that camera off. Okay. Which camera is it? Uh witness. Hmm? Witness. Your Honor, when the court has a moment, can we um, approach again with Miss D. Williams? You need three minutes, you said? You, Your Honor, we just need to reapproach again, Your Honor, briefly. Given that we just learned about this, I'm going to exclude it for the time being, okay? Let's just move on. I'll take it up in another time. We're not going to take it up right now. All right. Thank you, Your Honor. Your Honor, given that I have um, provided certain things, I just want to make sure that I comply with the Yeah, we could have taken that thing up an hour, uh, uh, an hour earlier, but, we, but I, you know, I'll take that issue up later. Okay.
Let me know when you're ready, ma'am. We're ready. Okay, all right. All right, if you wish to make an OB save at this point in time, please go ahead. All right. I'm going to now share my screen with for me. Yes, ma'am. Go right ahead. Now, this is the law of the jungle, as old and as true as the sky. And the wolf that shall keep it may prosper, but the wolf that shall break it must die. As the creeper that girdles the tree trunk, the law running forward and back. For the strength of the pack is the wolf. And the strength of the wolf is the pack. Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen, for being patient. Thank you so much for being honest during this very lengthy process that preceded this point here today during the voir dire process. I appreciate you all being here, exercising your civic duty, and honoring your obligation to pay close attention to what's going on in this courtroom for the next several however many weeks. Some people like to say that opening statements are a roadmap to what the trial will show Instead, I'm going to give you an overview, a bird's eye view, because you're going to be sitting here with evidence for the next several weeks at least. <laughs> and you will be able to see what that evidence is. Nothing that I say to you during this part of the trial, nothing any other attorney says to you during this part of the trial is evidence. But I can tell you what I expect the evidence to show. And what I expect the evidence to show in this case is that YSL, the group made up of the defendants sitting before you today, along with other both indicted and unindicted co-conspirators, YSL operated as a pack. The quote that I read to you earlier is from one of my favorite books as a kid, The Jungle Book, in case anybody recognized it. Those were right out of Kipling's words and not mine. But they are appropriate for where we are today. For 10 years and counting, the group calling itself Young Slime Life dominated dominated the Cleveland Avenue community of Fulton County. They created a crater in the middle of Fulton County's Cleveland Avenue community that sucked in the youth, the innocence, and even the lives of some of its youngest members. Now, the evidence is going to show that this group started out as a group called Rock Crew. And Rock Crew stands for Raised on Cleveland. The evidence is going to show you that Rock Crew, in fact, is a criminal street gang. It's not the kind y'all are used to. If you're more familiar with the national gangs, such as the Bloods and the Crips that operate in LA or in Chicago. But make no mistake about it, Rock Crew is and was a gang. It consisted of three or more members with common identifiers, signs, colors, linguistic choices that committed crimes on behalf of and in furtherance of Rock Crew itself. That particular organization aligned itself under an umbrella of a larger, more traditional street gang called Sex Money Murder Bloods, 
they adopted the nomenclature. They would do things like replace C's in words with the letter B, because traditionally Crips and Bloods were not aligned with one another. So Cleveland Avenue became Cleveland. Some of you may have indicated during Guadir, you've heard or are familiar with the Cleveland Avenue area. Maybe you've even heard of Cleveland Avenue Day. The evidence will show that this is where that comes from. The evidence will also show that sometime in 2012 or thereabouts, an internal rift or divide occurred among the members of Rock's crew. Now, the defendant, Jeffrey Williams, seated back there yawning right now, he was an original member of Rock Crew. And the kind of crimes that Rock Crew did consisted of smash and grab burglaries, stealing ATM machines, things of that nature. When Rock Crew split up, YSL, or Young Slime Life, was formed. And the defendant, Jeffrey Williams, was its proclaimed leader. Young Slime Life came about and consisted of three or more people when it began. Three or more people who were willing to, and who did, commit criminal street gang activity, that is crimes, that were intended to further the purposes and the advance the directives of YSL itself. Now, there will be no evidence of a written contract or anything like that. You won't see bylaws of YSL because this was a group of people associated in fact who used common identifiers, common names, common colors, common symbols to communicate with one another and to express themselves to the rest of the world. So YSL, as the evidence will show, they didn't move individually. The members and associates of YSL, they moved like a pack with the defendant Jeffrey Williams as its head. You'll hear from witnesses, both law enforcement and lay witnesses, who personally experienced and who personally witnessed the activities, the crimes that were committed. You will hear from law enforcement officers like Kimberly Underwood and Tyrone Dennis, whose main goal wasn't to go out in the streets and lock up people who looked like them. It was actually to touch souls in the streets, to touch young people, and to alert them of the dangers and the drawbacks of becoming a part of and becoming involved in gangs like YSL and Rock Crew. You'll hear about conversations with educators. You'll hear from members and associates of the gang itself. Now as to how those members and associates will respond or act once they're actually in court and on the stand. That's something that I am truthfully not able to predict to you fully. But the court has given you instructions on determining and judging the credibility of the witnesses. And I trust that all of you will in fact follow those instructions. The evidence will show that YSL checked all of the boxes for being a criminal street gang. As I stated earlier, they are three or more people associated in fact. Their members commit crimes on behalf of the gang. They commit crimes such as armed robbery, 
hijacking, motor vehicle theft, theft by receiving, stolen firearms, so many stolen firearms, possession of a machine gun, and narcotic sales, and last but certainly not least, murder. What you will not hear any evidence of is that the defendants were not involved in a criminal street gang. You will not hear any evidence that they did not commit crimes on behalf of YSL. And as I stated to you earlier, what I'm saying to you now is let, let me Let me object to that evidence. statement, please, as burden Based shifting. Object basis? Burden shifting. And um, under Parker versus the state at 277, 277, Why don't we take that up then? I'll, I'll note your objection. I'm sustaining the objection. Why don't you rephrase, madam? Yes, Your Honor. Just rephrase it. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to explain to you what the, I'm going to explain to you at the appropriate time, ladies and gentlemen, what the burden is in this case. Remember what I told you earlier that the burden never shifts to the defendants to prove for certain innocence, they're presumed innocent, and it, it's only until you hear um, evidence that you decide uh, is sufficient, and I'll instruct you on how you're supposed to do that at a later point in time. Okay? All right. The evidence will show that YSL did not appear and does not appear to all of the customs of a traditional street gang. And the fact that YSL does not mirror all the customs of a criminal street gang, the evidence will show makes it no less a criminal street gang. The defendants on trial here today have, through their actions, displayed not only their allegiance, their alliance with one another and with the gang itself. Through their actions, they have displayed an unspoken agreement to participate in that gang through a pattern of illegal activity. And again, the head of this gang is seated in this courtroom too. The last paragraph of that point that I read that spoke to you earlier goes as follows. Because of his age and his cunning, because of his right. This and is his argument. Heart, this is not. What's your objection, Mr. Harvey? That it's argument. Okay, Mr. Harvey, uh, hold on. Madam, it is argument at this point in time, so yes, I'll sustain sir. the objection, okay? Yes, sir. All right. The evidence will show that these defendants, that the members and associates of YSL, <coughs> they knew who their leader was, and they knew the repercussions of not obeying their leader. You will hear evidence that when members and associates of YSL got in trouble, got locked up, the first person they called was either this defendant or one of his family members. Now, they didn't call him directly because he knew and they knew that he needed to have distance between himself and the crimes members and associates of YSL were committing on behalf of the gang. So they would reach out to his sister and have his sister reach out to somebody else and eventually get back to King Slime, as they called him. You will hear evidence that members of YSL committed armed robberies. You'll hear evidence that to slime someone is to do them dirty, and that sometimes members of YSL committed crimes against other family members of their fellow gang members. You'll hear evidence that when one of the associates or members of YSL did something to what 
Jeffrey Williams had perhaps considered a friend, they were threatened with their very life. Tell them to get that stuff back or they will be killed. You will hear evidence that YSL, they had opposition within the city of Atlanta and Fulton County. That there were other gangs that were at various points in time at odds and even at war with YSL. One of those gangs was known as the IF Gang, IF, Inglewood Family. You will hear experts come in here and tell you more about how the Inglewood family bloods in any way made its way down to Fulton County. You will also hear evidence about how one of the members, one of the beloved, of whom YSL considered an opposition group, was gunned down. Donovan Thomas on January the 1st, 2015. January the 10th, my apologies. 2015. Gunned down. Openly and notoriously. Because the evidence will show that part of the reasons that criminal street gangs operate the way that they do is to establish dominance and to establish control and to establish fear. You're going to hear that this gang stole at least three lives from this community over the last 10 years. At least three that are referenced in this indictment. You'll find that as a result of this gang's activities, a young woman who had nothing to do with either YSL or any of their opposition was gunned down by people trying to get back at YSL for what they did. You'll hear evidence that after the murder of Donovan Thomas, no less than 50 shootings occurred over the course of the next several months. You'll hear evidence that hundreds, hundreds of bullets were fired into cars, into homes, and into people as a result of the rift young limelight had with other people in the community. So what are they accused of and what are you here for today? The judge read the four hour long indictment to you 12 months ago. He didn't read it to you again today, but he generally gave you what each defendant is being charged with and what the state has the burden of proving beyond a reasonable doubt as it relates to each defendant. But just to broadly touch on those, the crimes that the state is <coughs> proving to you over the next several weeks include conspiracy to violate the Racketeer Influence and Corrupt Organizations Act. That is an absolute mouthful. So we'll just say Rico. There's no substantive allegation of Rico violations here. And by that I mean there's a difference. Here the state is alleging that these defendants they had an agreement, unspoken, but no less an agreement, to obtain property, things of value, cell phones, cars, stolen guns, through a pattern of illegal activity. The evidence will show that it's, it's sort of like if two people said, okay, you know what, we're gonna to go toilet paper our dean of admissions house. And they sat there thinking and talking about it and someone overheard them and went and reported them to the police. 
And the police came and said, okay, I'm going to arrest you all for conspiracy, for planning to go and do this. The evidence will show that it's not enough that they were planning to do it. Somebody has to do at least one thing in order for those two people to be found guilty of conspiracy. So say one of you goes and says, let me go get the toilet paper now. Then y'all are in trouble. That's what we have here, and that's what the evidence is going to show. There was an agreement among the members of YSL to obtain property and things of value through a pattern of illegal activity. And it is their actions over the course of the last 10 years. It did not stop, by the way, in 2015. It didn't stop at all. It continued up through and even into 2023, after this case was indicted, as the evidence will show. But their actions are what the state will be looking to you to evaluate and determine, does this action show that they are agreeing to participate in this organization, this enterprise, through racketeering activity? You'll see evidence, as I stated, of not just drug sales, trap houses, drug houses, whole houses out of which drug sales were conducted where they held long long guns by the door, where they stood ready to act on command if either one of their number called. Who's on trial before you today is Rodelius Ryan, Pomarius Nichols, Marquavius Huey, Jeffrey Williams, Shannon Stilwell, Diamante Kendrick. And their actions during the dates that are listed in this indictment are what we are asking that you pay close attention to and you evaluate. Your Honor. You have an objection? Yes, sir. Basis of motion. Um, all right, ladies and gentlemen, this is one of our breaks. I'm going to need to probably put, ask you to retire to your headquarters at your deliberation room, and we'll call you back in just a minute, okay, when we finish up our business, all right? Remember the court's admonitions, ladies and gentlemen. Please be seated. Our jury has left us. All right, Mr. Steele, what's your what's your motion, sir? Good morning again, Your Honor. Your Honor, last week, two weeks, three weeks ago, you ordered the parties to share all of their displays an opening statement to the others so we don't have to have these interruptions. I did that. The state shared with me four attachments. That's all they had. That's what I got. What you just saw on your screen, if you don't remember, I'll ask the state to put it up and I asked for it to be marked as exhibit, is what you already excluded. It states that Mr. Ryan was convicted of murder and I represent the co-defendant who's not on trial on the appeal. How did that not get sent to me so I could bring it to the Sambo Court's attention, one? And two, 
How do we just violate court orders? So, yes, I have a serious motion for a mistrial because it's intentional misconduct. That's my motion. All right. And I'd like the screenshot to be um, captured for Ms. Weaver to put in the record. I'll admit it is, uh, is uh, next court exhibit in order of the state's presentation anyway. So, all right. So that'll be, uh, be court one for purposes of the trial. So, Ms. Um, Love, um, what's, your, what's your response to Mr. Steele's assertion about the, Mr. Ryan? As it relates to Mr. Ryan and the exhibits that the state intended to play and to um, display for the jury, I sent to Mr. Steele and everyone else the pictures and the photographs that I expected to use. Um, as it relates to um, the slide to which Mr. Steele is now referring regarding his representation on appeal, I'm not certain if the objection goes to the fact that there was the conviction because that's part of the indictment and that's part of the evidence that the state expects will show. Or if it's as to his objection about the fact that he represents Mr. Ryan or Mr. Blaylock on appeal. Don't represent Mr. Ryan. Mr. Blaylock, then. Excuse me. I never said this ever. That's it. Okay, what's, your, what's your objection based upon, Mr. Steele? Uh, objection based upon, I argued this before the Sovereign Court. You argued the prosecution that before they ever mentioned my name, you granted this motion. That I did. You brought him up to this Honorable Court outside the presence of everybody. We're an opening statement. I am lying to you. I am saying that. I am lying to you. I don't know if anyone else got that exhibit. I did not get that exhibit. And I'm seeing everyone say, Shady, no. And now it goes against the court's order. We are bound, duty bound, to follow this honorable court's order. I'm going to join in the objection on behalf of Mr. Steele. Let me see the. Let me I can see put it back up. Yes, ma'am. And, Your Honor, while I am putting that back up, I will state in my place that initially when there was the objection from Mr. Steele, I didn't have a clue what it was about because I didn't mention his name and didn't intend to mention his name. As I looked at the screen, I saw that part of his name was on the screen but for the I most part. That, but I mentioned that. I, I ruled upon that last week. I did. I, yeah. that we were not, I would take it as it came in this case, and if, it, if the evidence got to that point, then I would deal with it accordingly. Yes, Your Honor. So, um... And, Your Honor, as to Mr. Steele's motion as I'm pulling this up, the state would vehemently object to a mistrial and ask for a curative instruction um, and a reminder to the court, to the jury, that nothing that the lawyers say is evidence in this case. This is not at all the type of thing that um, rises to the level of mandating a mistrial. Certainly not. It just isn't. Um, I have the. All right. The slide. Well, uh, now, I now court, I'm, I'm court, about to share court one for purposes of the motion for mistrial. Mm Slide uh, 11 of 65, that I see where you have that um, at the bottom, represented by Brian Steele. So um, we can leave that for the time being. Leave it for the time being because it, it, it is what was it was it was up. I'm gonna just I'm gonna I'm going to uh, 
deny the motion for mistrial, Mr. Steele, but I will go ahead and give a curative instruction to our jurors at this point in time. So. Your Honor, I'm not supposed to ask for a re occur to the court for my mistrial before the next process goes on. I'd like you to do me a courtesy, if you would, and allow me to do that now and preserve the motion for a mistrial. You, you, you made your motion for mistrial I, and the basis, and I have marked the, I have marked the, I'm going to mark the whole state's presentation as is, as, as court one for the purposes of your motion, and it will go in as, uh, as stated. And I have two other issues I'd like the court to just take up. One is just remember, I know you ruled on it, but the state said earlier today that Mr. Williams is contacted through parties that they don't know to pay for other people's lawyers. So I think that couples with that exhibit. And number two, I'd like the court to now order prosecution to give me and anyone else who wants to see it. I need to see respectfully what you ordered last week, all of the displays of the state of Georgia that they have not, have not given to us. So what do you mean by the, what displays are you talking about, Mr. Steele? I never saw that. I never saw the wolf. I never saw um, the, um, the indictment. You ordered all the, I gave all my displays. I gave everything to say. I got from the state. Are you talking about using for opening statements, sir? Of course. Okay. Should have been done. All right. All right, Ms. Love. Yeah. But, Thank you, Your Honor. Um, two matters, Your Honor. Um, one, the first thing that Mr. Steele has requested of the court regarding the representation that the state made about other YSL members contacting Jeffrey Williams for representation is absolutely and has always been a part of what the state expects will show it. I'm going to deny that portion, but to Mr. Steele's point... Uh, we, I'd already made that issue in terms of his particular involvement and anything you need to let me know prior to that, and you need, I need to rule upon it, and also subject to foundation, yes. just like this. So yes. I assume that what you told our jurors is what you expect the evidence to show? Yes? Yes, All definitely. Right, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to overrule that part of his objection. What about the last thing you mentioned? And, Your Honor, as to um, the court's directive that we turn over anything or any exhibits or photographs. That was my understanding of the court's directive that we expect to show an opening statement. Um, as a matter of course, I can again reiterate the fact that it was an inadvertent um, omission to leave Mr. Steele at least part of his name on I got here. that, but he's, he's talking about is there, is there anything else you're going to use in opening you haven't shown to the defense counsel. He's telling us. Sharing. He's well. I said that. I told you to do that a week ago. Your Honor, because I, here's what here's what I told you was going to happen. I've got a jury that's out right now that's being interrupted, and Miss D. Williams, you should have made your motion or should have told me about that an hour ago or when you found out about it. Not hijack me at the bench about that. You did what you had to do, but I'm not happy about that. I'm not happy about any of this. Because this is stuff we could take care of before our jury comes in. And that makes you all, you know, lessen your ability as advocates and lessen our ability for this, for this jury to go ahead and get this case seamlessly. This is what I told you all was going to happen. So have you given them everything you're going to show them during opening statement? Your Honor, I haven't given them all of the word slides. I did give to them what Mr. Williams objected to. I had given that to them previously. I will give them or share with them the things that have been added as of this evening. And Can you do that over the next five minutes? I sure can. Deputy Ingram, can, or Sergeant Ingram, can you find out if our jurors are ready? Are they ready? Are they still using the restroom? They... I'll send that to them right now as we're waiting. Your Honor, we have a few your Honor, Jay Apt, on behalf of Mr. Kendrick, can we have five or ten minutes to review whatever Ms. Love is going to send us? You can take a comfort break, and I'll come back at 10 of, uh, 10 of, of um, 12. And um, like I said, whatever we don't finish before 12, 15, we'll, we'll pick up after lunch, okay? Thank you, Your Honor. Who's, 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 who's talking? 
Yes, Shark. Yes, Mr. Shark. On behalf of Mr. Stillwell, um, we've been operating pretrial with the Harvey rule. I want to make sure that it, the record is clear that we join Mr. Steele in his motion for mistrial. And if Your Honor, I'll would, apply the Harvey rule unless you tell me otherwise. Okay. And that will apply throughout trial. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Unless you tell me otherwise. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right, we're going to be in recess about 10 minutes, all right? Your Honor, what I'm going to do um, before sitting is I'm going to actually do a search for this first four letters of Mr. Steele's name and make sure that I didn't need anything else in there. So, um, before I do that, I'm going to do that. I'll make a search for
All right, have we concluded our, our sharing exercise? I told you all to go ahead and uh, talk with each other through when we broke. I did share the honor. All right. So if I may, Your Honor. Yes, ma'am. Regarding the court's earlier uh, concern brought to the court's attention by Mr. Williams, um, Ms. Hilton shared with me what was said on the bench, but as it relates to Cordelius Ryan's um, post after the murder of Shamel Drinks. That was provided um, from day one in discovery, Your Honor. And it is not a crime that he is alleged to have committed. We may have put that on a list, you know, of, out of, you know, including things. But, Your Honor, that is not an intrinsic act in the sense of it being a crime or a criminal act. And it is what the evidence is going to show um, happened. What I have in the PowerPoint, I can show the court if you like. I sent that to defense counsel prior to today. I think I sent it Friday before five. But what I have said is that on the day that Shamel drinks his, I'm, I'm sorry, Jamari Holmes, my apologies to the court and to the family members here. What I said was that on the day that Mr. Holmes was gunned down, 12 hours after that murder, Mr. Ryan posted on his Instagram account, I bet YSL makes the news. And what I, what I endeavored to say to the jury um, that the evidence will show is just that, um, that they were advertising and representing and boasting on behalf of the gang itself immediately after the murder occurred. And these are elements that the court, I believe, will hear from detectives and evidence, these are things that the courts have said, jurors and the courts should look to in determining whether something is done in furtherance of a game. And so I would ask the court, I didn't take it out as the court instructed, I would ask that the court allow me to make reference to it. And thank you, Your Honor, for your time. All right, Mr. Williams. Oh, sit down, Mr. Adam. Are, are you, you, you can, just, 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 just wait a minute. All right, Mr. Williams. What's your response, madam? That the court already ruled on that, saying that you would bring it up as it comes forth. You stated that they couldn't use it in the opening, and I would just ask that the court use their instruction and make the state follow the instruction that the court already gave. Okay, but it, it, it may not be what I think that Ms. Love is saying, Mr. Williams, is that the evidence may not necessarily be intrinsic. It might be for another purpose. It's what they expect the evidence to show. So... Um, but here's the issue that kind of I'm disappointed is the court. You all could, we've had months and months and months. We could have taken this up before. I could have made it very clear. I don't need to take it up right on the eve of our jury sitting in the box. That's what I'm kind of more annoyed with than anything else. If you had clarity or wanted to seek clarity on that, I'm more than happy to rule on it. But I needed to go ahead and have some ability to do so. So I don't think it's intrinsic. It may be for other purposes, and I'll let the state reference that if they have a good faith basis to, um, that if they believe that's what the evidence will show. Okay? They put it in their motion as Say again, madam. I'm sorry. They put it in their motion as intrinsic evidence, though. So they shouldn't have put it in their motion if they were going to Yes, ma'am. I would probably agree with you. But so did, I ever get, their, did I have a rule on that issue? You said that you would do it later as it came Okay, out. well, here's the thing. Later is now. I got a jury in the box. So you could have asked me that an hour. I mean, we had time this morning. I could have gone through that this morning and made clarity on it for both sides. But do you have any other basis for the ruling? I mean, for my ruling, madam, any other argument? No, just I wish that the court would just follow their own instruction. Well, I, I'll follow my instructions when you all bring to my attention what you need to in a timely manner, okay? And give me the full breadth of so I can rule upon it accordingly. That's what I'd like you all to do. Well, they also have slide 45. They have my client's name on there as gunning down a 23-year-old, Shymel Drinks. And 
my client has nothing to do with that. But right. I didn't get that. Ms. Love, says she, Ms. Love says she is going to remedy that and exclude it. Thank you, Your Honor. Okay. All right. Now, Mr. App, what I, is it you want to tell me? I am so sorry, Your Honor. I, but thank you for, for allowing me to speak. Um, I do have an objection, Judge. So, uh, Ms. What's Love, your objection specifically, sir? Attempted to email us during the break uh, the PowerPoint slides that she is using in opening. I could not open the attachment. I brought that to the attention of her uh, co-counsels and staff. And um, Mr. Matthews was able to open it, and, and I looked over his shoulder and was able to see some of it. There are at least a dozen more slides that were never turned over to us, even though the court instructed us to share with the state and for the state to share with us prior to opening uh, any uh, exhibits for opening argument and so I, I mean these are all new to us and I, I would just ask that the ones that she did not share she shared four uh, that the ones that she did not share be excluded I, I'm objecting because the court ordered for us to share these she did not clearly she did it intentionally there's also apparently factual errors in them I would ask that any slides that haven't already been shown to the jury and that she did not disclose be excluded from her opening argument <laughs> Yes, ma'am, and I'll go on to the next person. Thank you, Joe. Yes. Your Honor, I did not send only four um, slides or attachments. I sent to the counsel for the defendants the photographs, the evidence that I intended to put into the opening PowerPoint. As far as the state's theory of the case and theme of the case and the words that I wrote, those are things that were on, being developed, ongoing, and... I, I don't, I did not understand the court's directive to mean that we needed to turn over the words we would be speaking. As far as these photographs go, Judge, I said to them, um, if they can, actually, I, I sent them to them. So there are some, I have only about. Your Honor, they're a dump, they're a dump court. Oh, oh, hold on, wait, 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 let her finish. And then I'll, then I'll, then I'll let you respond, Ms. Trapps. So the, all of these slides that involve Christian Ebinger, I sent to them. And other than the slides involving Christian Ebinger, there is a slide of the vehicle that Donovan Thomas drove on the day he was done down. It's the back of the vehicle with the placards um, of showing the bullet defects. That will be shown. There's no one that has made any objection to that evidence being introduced at trial. Nothing that I have put in the PowerPoint <coughs> includes anything that has been objected to as being admissible at trial. And I, I believe that um, I'm not certain if this app thinks that we only serve four. Um, make, I don't know if he had trouble opening it up, but we served, I think, all of them, if not the great majority of them, because I don't have that many. I don't even have 20 photographs in this PowerPoint. So everything, that, and I can show the court, I would share it if I did not, with the court as well. But these photographs, I have a picture of Donovan Thomas in life. I have a picture of the barbershop where he was gunned down. I have a picture of the back of Donovan Thomas's Tahoe. I have a picture of Donovan Thomas's headshot. At the time of the autopsy, no cutting, no nothing, just his face with the number. Um, I have a picture of, as I stated earlier, Your Honor, the truck with the defects noted. And then I have pictures of Christian Eppinger, um, all of which were provided. And that's the extent of it. The majority of the slides have my my words, my theory, my work product on them. All right. Mr. App, before, before I go ahead and respond. Your Honor, she's no, no one's suggesting that she had to turn over the text of her opening argument. But if she's going to show a PowerPoint to the jury, that is what the court instructed us to share. We're, we're visual exhibits, and that's what she's doing. She's placing it up on a screen for the jury to see. And whether that's her own words 
as part of her opening as a PowerPoint, or it's just demonstrative. She could have shared it, and she didn't. And she did it. And she, she suggesting now to the court as a work in progress that she hasn't worked on her opening statement until this past weekend. I, I don't believe that. I think she's, if that's the case, then she's just lying to the court. But if that's not, if, if that's not the case, and she didn't mean to mislead the court just now, then she could have and should have shared those PowerPoints. As to the photographs, those also could have been shared with um, prior to opening. If there's, uh, no one's suggesting they're not admissible at trial. If they're admissible, she can admit them at trial. But to show them to the jury now is part of our opening that violates this court's order that we were supposed to share our exhibits for opening prior to trial, which she did not do. So I think they should be excluded from the opening. And if she wants to introduce them later as evidence during the course of the case, then so be it. But I think there is good grounds for this court to, and, and you know, Your Honor got upset because these issues could have been handled. Uh, they didn't have to wait until now. This is wasting time while the jury's waiting. Your Honor's right. And, and it's not our fault. It's her fault for not doing what the court instructed. And as a result, the appropriate and, and reasonable remedy is to prevent her from sharing any of these slides with the jury that she did not share with defense counsel prior to today. Whether they're evidence or whether they're text is part of her opening. All right, Mr. Matthews. Yes, Your Honor. Good morning to the court. I'd like to uh, direct the state's attention to slide 15. In slide 15, uh, the third bullet point, uh, it references October 1st, 2020, in terms of that quote from a text message. In the indictment, Your Honor, if you look at over Act 102, that's where that particular uh, quote comes from, over Act 102. In, in over Act 102, the date of that alleged uh, text message was March 12, 2020, not October 1st, 2020, as in the PowerPoint presentation, that's number one. Number two, the quote in the indictment is different from the quote in the PowerPoint. So that's two errors in slide 15 pertaining to Mark Wavy's Huey. And then when you go to slide 16, Slide 16 is an overt act that is alleged in the indictment as overt act 123. In the state's opening presentation, the date they have is October 1, 2020. But in the indictment, that particular overt act is November 16, 2020. So that's a, a third error in the uh, State's opening uh, slide presentation, so those need to be correct to mirror the indictment so that it's not misleading the jury and, in fact, giving wrong information to the jury judge. So I would ask that the state correct that, remove it, or correct it. All right. Anybody else? Yes, Mr. Sharp. Your Honor, on behalf of Mr. Stillwell. Speak up, please. On behalf of Mr. Stillwell, um, slide number 47. Um, it suggests that Mr. Stilwell is still committing crimes on behalf of the gang even after being indicted on these charges. Um, we have, we began to discuss um, intrinsic acts and other, other um, th unindicted allegations last week. Um, but we did not get through it. And my understanding was that anything that you had not ruled upon, we were not supposed to uh, reference or discuss in opening statements. So those are clear references to um, unindicted charges that we did not get a ruling on its in admissibility yet. And I would ask that that just be taken out of the presentation and no mention be made of those. Anybody else? Okay. Yes, Mr. Steele. Thank you, sir. Um, if you would look at also number, I'm looking at now, 48, 49, 53, 54, 55. That's, that's your prerogative. That's within your zone. That's law. Would, would the court allow Mr. Steele to repeat those slide numbers? 
Because what I think that he's referring to is something that I placed in here that the court said during its um, preliminary instructions to the jury. And it was regarding um, the court, as a matter of fact, it was the last thing that the court said. And all that I did was put on the slide, judge's law. <clears throat> In terms of uh, in terms of what uh, what slides are you talking about, Mr. Steele? Again, I have a 48, 49, 53, 54, 55. So 49, 48 through 55, excluding so 48, 49, but then skipping to 53, 54, and 55. 48, 49. Your Honor, may I share via Zoom? Um, the slides that Mr. Seals. I would, yes, please. Thank you. And he, he said, Mr. Seals, you get 45. Just share, share, the, share the presentation, please. Yes, different you might want to just redo it um, any further uh, objections folks yes sure uh, I went over to the state's table Karch and Matthews and Beth Mr. Drew I went over to the state's table and brought to their attention an error up in slide 42 and I think it's incorrect all right is that correct today? here's a, Not yet, but in a moment. all right here's what I'm going to do um Folks, this is exactly why I told you, I wanted you to, and, and let me go ahead and just say this, Ms. Love, I told you to give them your pre PowerPoint presentation. This is why you give it to them, so that they can get errors and they can also figure out there's something they object to. So um, this is what's caused this delay. Because at this point, like I told you, there's no secrets in, in the trial of this case. You all have gone through quite a, quite a long process. Um, but this just highlights the concerns the court had 
in terms of just breaking up the presentation for our jurors. So what I'm going to do, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to go ahead and call our jurors out. I'm going to go ahead and release them for lunch. I'm going to tell them they're going to be at lunch until 1.30. During the lunch hour, Ms. Love, I want you to play or the slides that you have um, that otherwise have not been um, shown. You need to show them to the defense counsel and make sure they're correct. In the absence of them being corrected, I'm going to exclude your presentation. They have the presentation. But it needs to be correct. I don't want, I, if I get another objection about an error, I'm going to exclude it for the purposes of the opening statement because you didn't follow my instructions. This is why I told, her, I told everyone, get, they need to get, they, and, and the defendants needed to give you their, their opening statements and the things they wish to use during, uh, during, the, during their openings as well because we're, we're having interruptions and delay, and that's what I wanted to avoid for our jurors. That was the reason I told you all to do that. So, Your Honor, as far as um, any, any typographical errors, I'm not worried about that. I'm not worried about that. But I'm, I'm not worried about that. But but the errors that Mr. App, Mr. Matthews, and Mr. St and Mr. Still, I mean Mr. Shaw have made are are errors, and Ms. D. Williams need to be corrected. Okay. Yes, Your Honor. I will, of course, do it for the And but but everyone else needs to see it so they can be comfortable and make sure that you you represented something that what you expect the evidence to show to be correct. Okay. Thank you, Judge. We'll do it. And I, I, Your Honor, I also wanted to point out to the court that even if I spoke, even if I misspoke, the court has already instructed the jury and will continue to instruct them that nothing I say is evidence. And if I misspeak or miswrite. Um, but that's not the point. But that's not the point. I'm gonna tell them that. But but and I told them that already. But that's not the point. The point is so that we can have a smooth and orderly presentation of evidence. Okay. Yes, oh, so, yes. all right. Uh, Sergeant Ingram, can we go ahead and call for our jurors, please? You you can you can go ahead and take care take up that during the during the recess. Okay. Yes, sir. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, please be seated. All right, members of the jury, uh, we apologize uh, profusely for the delay, but I got some good news. I'm going to send you a lunch. How about that? But the bad news is I'm not paying for it. So um, hopefully you all, hopefully you all brought something or have made suitable plans consistent with the court's earlier um, suggestions to you. So what I'll do is at this point in time is it's about uh, 12, 20, almost 12:25. I'm going to recess you until um, 1:45 to allow you to have take comfort and take a you know, big long stretch and um, get yourself something to eat. I would advise you um, from doing this a while. Don't eat too much carbohydrate-laden food because you will fall asleep, and then I'll be looking at you and have to <laughs> and have to embarrass you. I want to do that so. 
Uh, I just ask you to take that nugget of consideration from somebody who's been doing this a while, all right? But um, remember my admonitions that I told you. Remember when you go out, if you should decide to go out to eat lunch, remember you've got a time time uh, you know deadline you need to get back for because we're going to try and call everybody out promptly around 145 or thereabouts and go ahead and get started leave your notepads in the in your basket if you decide to go out there and remember all the admonitions that i've given you thus far um they apply to you um and continue to apply to you all right so unless you have any other inquiry of me ladies and gentlemen i'm gonna bid you a good lunch and i will see you back at 145 okay all right all eyes for julie All right, ladies and gentlemen, please be seated. Our jury has left us. All right, so ladies and gentlemen, consistent with my earlier directions, go ahead and take a look at that, make those corrections, and I'll see everybody back for 145, and we'll go ahead and continue with opening statements at that point in time, okay? All right, we're in recess. <laughs>